All right, hello once again. This is Jeff Scott of Blackhawk Technical College. As promised, I'm going to do some separate lectures so we can finish up the Java book that we're using, uh, the Gaddis book, Java Early Objects, starting out with Java Early Objects, 5th edition. And I'm going to go over Chapter 9 right now, Inheritance. Again, we've done a program of this in the class that was the Bank Account Savings Account program, but I'm going to go over the PowerPoints, and I'm also going to go over the pages that are in the book. All right, so I'm going to try to do that today for 9 and for 10. So let's get started. All right, here's our topics. What is inheritance? Calling the superclass constructor, overriding superclass methods. Protected members, classes that inherit, that inherit from subclasses, the object class, polymorphism, abstract classes, abstract methods, and interfaces. <clears throat> the example that they give here is they say that if you were to use bumblebee and grasshopper, they're both are insects. So if you look at this, this is UML, Unified Modeling Language, to say that bumblebee and grasshopper, these lines here, and then the line going up with the arrow pointing here means they both inherit from insect. So if we were creating this and we were going to try to show this in a Java class or a series of Java classes, we could take anything that all insects have in common because there's more than just bumblebee and grasshopper. There's fly and there's a lot of other things. All right. If we said, for example, and I don't know if this is true or not, but if we said that all insects fly, we could have a fly method here. <clears throat> if we said that all insects have eyes or legs or whatever, we could put that in here. All right. And then we would add here the things that are distinct to bumblebees. They sting, etc. And here we would add the things distinct to grasshoppers. All right. And as it says, those attributes and methods distinct or specific to a bumblebee or to a grasshopper. <clears throat> and this is known as an is a relationship. A bumblebee is a or is an insect. A grasshopper is a or is an insect. In much the same way, in the example that we did in class, a savings account is a bank account, that kind of thing. So they give you some examples right here. So again, the, the child object, what Gaddis calls the specialized object, has all of the characteristics of the parent, <coughs> excuse me, plus anything additional that we decide to add. The key word that you use to do all this stuff is the word extends. All right, so we say that the child extends the parent. The parent class is typically known as the super class. It sometimes is known as the parent class. Back in the days of political incorrectness, it was known as the master class. The child class is also known as the subclass. It's sometimes known as the child class. And again, back in the days before political correctness, it was actually called sometimes the slave class. And I'm saying that not because I'm at all advocating it. I'm not. But I want to tell you that because occasionally in documentation, you'll still see the stuff that way. <clears throat> the parent is also sometimes called the base class. The child class is also called sometimes the derived class. So as it says, the subclass inherits any method in any field from the superclass without it being rewritten. This is also going to introduce to us that we're going to see later on in here a new type of access modifier, and that is the word protected. <clears throat> so typically, for instance, when I come in here, and this is the, one of the examples they give in class in the text, final exam extends graded activity. What does that mean? That means that anything that was defined in graded activity is going to be available to final exam without it having to, to re, redo it, so to speak. If there is something in graded activity, for instance, maybe points possible, all right? Maybe, the, no, I, I shouldn't even say that. Maybe there's a grading method for grading activity that you set up. And maybe for a final exam, maybe it's not the same. So maybe the graded activity that you have for all non-final exams is 90 and up is an A, 80 and up is a B, 70 and up is a C, 60 and up is a D, and below 60 is an F. Maybe for a final exam you set it up so it's pass-fail, 
as an example. So what could happen was the final exam could extend the graded activity, but it could override, and that's the word that's used, anything that's in graded activity that it wants to change. Another UML example. So as it says, graded activity contains everything that's in here. All right, all the stuff that you see in here is now going to be available in here. So final exam can just think about those things that are unique to final exam. I a mistake there. That should be, oops, final, not fina exam. Members of a super class that are marked private. <clears throat> so anything that's in here that's marked private, you notice that score is. Score is not directly available in here to be changed. As long as you make this private. If you make this protected, I think they use a pound sign for that. So the minus is private, the plus is public, and I believe it's a pound sign. We'll see it a little later in here. That means protected. If something is private, it's only directly accessible and changeable in here. These things that are public are directly accessible and usable in here. Those are methods. <clears throat> if we mark something in a parent as being protected, then it can be changed in the child. So again, if the member of the superclass is marked private, they're not directly inherited. They may only be accessed by the public methods of the superclass. If they're marked private, they're directly inherited, and they may be directly accessed from the subclass. When an instance of a subclass is created, the non-private methods are available. So in other words, we said final exam equals new final exam. All right, and notice what we're saying in here, exam.setscore. Well, setscore was set up here. But since it's public, it's directly accessible and usable by the child. Non-private methods are available in, in the subclass. Anything is basically private. <clears throat> Any non-private method and non-private field is available to the child. That's what I wanted to say. Constructors are not inherited. So when you are a child and if you want to call the parent constructor, you have to call use the word super and then pass anything that the parent constructor would need. And you have to have that as the first executable statement in the method. When a subclass is instantiated, the superclass default constructor is executed first. So again, super refers to an object's superclass. And let's say that, that uh, you've got a parent that has a child, and that child has a child. If I say super and the, the uh, parent doesn't have any, any constructor, but the grandparent does, it'll go up the chain, so to speak, until it finds something that it's looking for. <clears throat> if a parameterized constructor is defined in the superclass, all right, the superclass must provide a no art constructor or the subclass must provide a constructor and the subclasses must call the superclass. Again, as I mentioned to you, Calls to the superclass must be the first Java statement in the constructors. Now, we're, when we go through this in a little more depth and breadth of coverage a little bit later, and we look at this, <clears throat> you're going to see examples. But again, for right now, most of the stuff that they're showing you in here are just, uh, it's more theoretical in nature. All right? A subclass may have the same signature, in other words, the same method, the same parameters, the same return type as a superclass. That's known as an overrided method. When you do this, it's known as method overriding. So in other words, you, if we look in here, notice we've got set score here and we've got set score here. So what, what um, they're saying is this has to be set score, it has to have a double passed in, and it must not return anything. So the signatures must be the same. But as mentioned in the text over here, this method is a more specialized version of set score. So recall from, boy, this was back in chapter one. A method signature consists of the method's name, the data types that appear inside of the parameters. 
A subclass method that overrides the superclass must have the same exact signature. So by default, if you try to invoke the method inside of the subclass, it will invoke the child. If you wanted to invoke the parent, you have to say super dot method name, as they show right here. As they mentioned there, there's a distinction between overloading and overriding. Overloading is when a method has the same name, but one or more different signatures. Let's just take a look. I'm just going to make an example up. This won't be a complete Java program, but first let's look at overloading. So let's assume that in my program I've got this, public add to, you've seen this before, int a, int b. Return a plus b. Well, I'm going to copy that a couple times. So now let's assume, that should have been an int, I'm sorry, public int, public float, let's make it a double, double a and double b, and let's make this one a string. I think there was a capital S. It's been a while since I've even written anything like this, so sorry about that. So I want to return A plus a blank space plus B. So we have three different methods. The return type on each one is different. The parameter types of each are different. The functionality is pretty much, pretty much the same between them. But the method signatures are different. So as the author says, there is a distinction between overloading and overriding. Overloading is when a method has the same name as one or more methods, but a different signature. That's what we're showing here. Let's quickly look at overriding. See if I got enough room to put it up here. So let's assume that right here, so I'm in the parent. So in the parent class, I put in this. Oops. So in the parent, I'm going to do the same kind of thing. Let's move these over both one, make it a little easier to read. So in the parent, I'm going to put in public add to, we'll make it an int again, int a, int b. All right. Let me set my size down just a little bit, set it down from 16 to 14. There we go. All right. <clears throat> so I've got that in here. And as we saw, this is our familiar return A plus B. So nothing really new right there. All right. Now I'm going to, though, say child class here. So what if, what if right here I want to return A plus B, but then I want to do something with it? Do you understand what I'm saying? Hopefully you do. So not only do I want to return A plus B, all right, not only do I want to return A plus B, but I want to write the answer down. So maybe I want to do a, a, a uh, system.out.println. So I'm going to say here, public int add to int, we'll call it n1 and n2. So I'm going to say super dot add two and pass n1 and then pass n2. And then on the next line here, I'm going to say system dot out dot print line. Uh, here we'll say this sum equals. So let me let me go back here. Hold on. 
It's going to look a little funky for just a second because I goofed up. All right, so super. And before that, I want to say... Yeah, it will look funky for a second, but that's okay. Int sum equals... And I want that to equal super dot add to n1 n2. That's the line I'm looking for. And then I'll say system dot out dot print line sum equals I'm kind of running out of room here, so I'll put this on another line. Now, try to follow this along with this if you can. In this example, every time we had the same number of parameters, the only thing that changed was the return type. That's overloaded methods. An overwritten method, this signature, this signature that's right here has to be exactly identical between here and here. You can say, wait a minute, Jeff, this says int A and that says int B. Then those names after that, those names don't mean anything. We could have called them A and B here. That would have been fine, but we don't have to. But then rather than us having our own method that adds the two, we can call the parent method. That's what we're doing right here. We're calling super.add2 with A and B. So that A there becomes that A here, that B there becomes that B here. We return the result, we stick it into sum, then we print it out. So all we've done here is we've added just a little bit more functionality in the second example. So our add to in the child does a little bit more than our add to did in the parent. Overloading, overriding. And I'll save that, so if you want to take a look at it, no problem. All right. Both overloading and overriding can take place in inheritance. Overriding can only take place in an inheritance relationship, but you can have overloaded methods when you're using inheritance. If you don't want a method to be overridden, you put the word final in front of it. Now remember, we've used final in the past, which means constant, and in some ways it kind of means the same thing. Because if you put the final method on a, a parent, for example, if I put public final, then if I attempt to overload it, like we did here, this would result in an error right there because it would say it's final, it can't be overloaded. This is considered poor programming practice to put the final modifier on a method. And it's considered a poor programming practice just because of the fact that you never know when somebody may want to extend the class that you're working with. So you should avoid that when possible. All right, we also talked about protected. All right, so if we go back a long ways to the example that's right here. And I mentioned to you when we looked at this example that score right there being a double is not, di not directly able to be manipulated in here because when a parent declares something as private, the child can't directly, can't directly change it or modify it. It can only indirectly do it through public methods of the parent. But if we'd, have put, if we'd have made this protected here, protected means make it available not only to the parent, but to all, all children and their children and their children, etc. And that's what they talk about in here. As they say, a protected me member's access is somewhere between private and public. Private meaning that it's only available in the class in which it's been defined. Public meaning it's available anywhere. And, and protected meaning that it's available in the parent class and in any child classes, all the way down the inheritance tree. As it says, using protected instead of private makes some tasks easier but remember, when you do that, that any derived class, so any child class of the parent, 
child, grandchild, great-grandchild, great-great-grandchild, etc. It's not considered good practice to, to have too many things that are, that, that are, in fact, especially your data, you almost always make that private. And then you provide public methods for accessing that. As it says, if you don't use public and you don't use private and you don't use protected, then it's given package access. You know what package access is because we've been creating packages since day one. Package access means that any file in the package that you're working with has access to that data. And they put this in the book. There, it's, it's in the book. We'll go over it again later, too. But this pretty much just explains what I just told you. We'll look at it in more depth and breadth of coverage a little later. All right, chains of inheritance. A super class can all be, also be derived from another class. Every time you create a class, so if I were to have come in here in the example I did earlier, in this example, let me hit enter a couple, uh, right here. No, well, it's not going to work well here, but so let's say that right here, the parent class, there was none. There was no parent right there, okay? So in here, literally, we had something like public class addition, okay? Something like that. Well, every time you create a class, if you don't do any extends, it's as though you wrote this, extends object. Because object is kind of like the root that you have when you're working in a, in a directory structure. Everything extends from object, either directly like graded activity or indirectly like pass-fail activity and pass-fail exam do. Okay. Classes are often depicted graphically in a class hierarchy. This would be level 0, level 1, and level 2. So that's a level 2 hierarchy. And as it says, this class hierarchy shows the inheritance relationship between classes. Again, note the arrow that points up and the arrow is, for lack of better words, colored in or however you want to refer to it. It's not an empty arrow. Okay. So again, all Java classes directly or indirectly derive from class object. It's in the java.lang package, so you don't have to include it. All right. So what they're saying right there is in that example, I want to use that, theirs is probably better than mine. That's the same thing. Same thing as all right, so those two things are identical. I'll just say same as. So public class my class and public class my class extends object are the same thing. All right. The java.lang class contains two string and equals and a bunch of other stuff. All right, next they talk about polymorphism. So their example is okay, but I'm going to give my own right here. So I'm going to go down a little further in this thing that I've been creating right here. So we're going to quickly create a little class hierarchy. We'll do it right here. And we'll call this class animal. All right, and underneath animal we'll have human. We'll have bird, we'll have dog, and we'll have cat. All right, we're just keeping it simple here. All right, and the only thing that we're going to make available, the only method that we're going to make available under animal here is a method that's called speak. All right, and again, <clears throat> all of the things that you see here again. All right. What that means is now by default, and I, I don't have the ability because I'm just using Notepad++, but that would, have inter that would human uh, would inherit from animal, so would bird, so would dog, so would cat. Okay? But the thing is, so each one of these is going to have a speak method. So for here, 
I might have something that looks like this. Public speak, paren paren, and it's going to just say system, I'm going to run out of room, but let's just say hello. All right, so I'd have to put a system.out.print line there, but I think you're all smart enough that you can get what I mean there. All right, so here we have a public speak. Move that over a bit. And that one, and I'm not good at bird calls, so that one would basically say caw, like a crow says. <clears throat> and the dog that would have a public speak that would say woof again these would all have system.out.print line before them the only way I can show you that is to make the, the font size on here incredibly small and I don't want to do that alright and then finally we'd have public oops speak for a cat and as you would guess that would say meow now the point is if I create an object from here and I say dog fluffy and that'd be probably a better cat's name dog spike equals new dog and then I say spike dot speak well you should know I mean you're all smart enough to get this what that's going to do is that's going to you're gonna see woof on the screen if I say cat this time we will say cat fluffy equals new cat and I say fluffy dot speak then it's going to say meow if I come down again and I say bird Polly equals new bird and I see you got a mistake up above. Should be a capital C. And I say poly dot speak. Then it's going to say caw. And finally, if I say human, mark equals new human. And I say well, Marky, and I say Mark dot speak. It's going to say hello. And what I'm getting to <clears throat> is I can override the same method on multiple objects. And when I create different objects of different types, and I call that overloaded method, speak, 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 the system knows which speak to call based upon the type of object that I'm working with. That's polymorphism. All right, now do they show it better in the book? You decide. That's fine. If you think it's easier to understand from the book, then just forget you heard the last couple minutes. Whoops, that was good. Now, when we look through this, we've got here exam equal new graded activity. And it says the graded activity class is also the super class for the final exam class. So any object of final exam is also a graded activity class. And you can get some really weird looking stuff in here. Polymorphism is a Greek term that means many forms. And in this case, it means that an object 
is able to take on many forms. If you look at the last bullet on the screen right here, it says a reference variable is polymorphic because it can reference objects of types different than its own, as long as its super subclasses are of the same type. Now, they show you examples, and you might look and go, well, that's not really what you showed us, Jeff. No, what I showed you is the way, more often than not, that polymorphism is used. All right, so I'll let you look at this yourselves. We'll go back and talk about it a little bit later. Now, notice they talk about dynamic, dynamic binding or late binding, and I think we've talked about this earlier. All right, if you work with an array in Java, an array, when you set up an array in Java, you cannot change the size while the program is running. The array size is set up when you compile the program. That means that arrays in Java are what are known as early binded. Sometimes you might hear static binding, okay? But it's typically they're early binded. On the other hand, when you're working in Java and you have an array list, you can change the size of the array list as the program is running. So you can do that dynamically. So an array list is dynamically binded or late binded. All right, as it says, the Java virtual machine at runtime determines which method or which whatever to call depending on the circumstances. It is the object's type rather than the reference type that determines which method is called. All right, and again, where it says this, look at it this way. A child can do anything a parent can do, plus anything that you've defined that's unique for the child. The parent can only do what you've defined for the parent. A parent cannot do directly what you said a child, one of its children, can do. All right. If you remember, back from when we were doing the assignment, we made bank account class an abstract class. An abstract class is one that cannot be instantiated or nude, but other classes can use it as a template. So as it says, an abstract class serves as a superclass for other classes. It, re it represents such a generic or abstract form of the class that you'd never want to create one of those directly. And again, as mentioned, bank account. All right, or in here. Animal would be an abstract class. For something to be able to for you to be able to say that something is an animal, you don't know in that case in, in what we have here, is it a human, is it a bird, is it a dog, is it a cat, or is it some other kind of animal? All right. So as they mentioned there, a class becomes abstract when you place the word abstract in the class definition. You can also create abstract methods. An abstract method, as it says, has no body, but it's part of the API that we talked about the other day, the application program interface. What If you've got a class that's abstract and the class has abstract methods in it, then those abstract methods must be implemented with the same signature in any class that extends the abstract class. All right. says, note that the keyword abstract appears in the header and that the header ends with a semicolon. So it looks like this. Any class that contains an abstract method automatically is abstract. So you should always put the word abstract. If a subclass fails to override and provide its own abstract method of the one in its class, you get a compiler error. So what I might have done here, since in the example that I showed you, all right, in that example, since, whoops, uh, sorry. Since animal was going to be an abstract class, I would have made speak an abstract method. So it would be overridden, but it would have to be inside of each one of the classes that extend animal. An interface is similar to a class in that all it has is abstract methods. But 
Remember in Java, you can only inherit from one class, but you can have multiple interface inheritance. So an, an interface uses the word interface instead of the word class, so it looks like this. And a class, again, can inherit multiple interfaces. So we could have said here, if we needed to, public class exam three extends graded activity implements relatable comma, hello, comma, goodbye, where hello and goodbye would have been two more interfaces. And whereas with, with inheritance, you use the word extends, with interfaces, you use the word implements to differentiate between those two. An interface can contain field declarations, but typically all they contain for field declarations are constants. Again, you can have multiple interfaces, and that's what they're showing right here. All right, that's some UML. I don't really care. You can use all this stuff together. So you could use polymorphism along with inheritance, along with interfaces. You can use any combination or any one or any two or all three. We'll look at this example that they talk about here in just a couple minutes. So that's it for this chapter. All right, I'm going to go over, I'm going to save that, and I'm going to go over the actual chapter. I'll leave this up there, and then when I get done with that, I'm going to next go over chapter 10. just want to see how many slides are in that. A few more. All right, so that's what we'll be covering very soon.